Hello, everybody. Uh, here we are, I think, getting towards the end of day one, Ready 23. Um, another panel with uh, another amazing set of panelists, this time focused how AI is being used to enhance school safety. Um, I have with me uh, Rob Huberty, um, co-founder and chief operating officer of ZeroWise, uh, Barb Davidson, uh, director, Ingham County uh, 911 in Michigan, and I've got Chief Chris Rosman, uh, MSU uh, Deputy of Public Safety uh, and, and Chief of Police, I believe, uh, Chris. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, uh, I'd love to turn it over to you guys. A uh, quick intro, uh, your background in public safety, um, and then maybe a little bit about uh, yourselves and sort of maybe a, your technology journey uh, to date, and then we'll kind of get into the meat of of the panel. But um, uh, Rob, then Barb, then then Chief Roseman. Perfect. I'm Rob Huberty, uh, CEO, co-founder of Zero Eyes. So I, my background, I grew up in a town called Monroe, Connecticut. I went to a school that was called Chalk Hill, and it was ultimately named Sandy Hook Elementary School. After that shooting, they moved into the school that I went to. I ended up graduating high school in 1999, and I went to the University of Arizona, and I went to school with uh, probably about 20 survivors of Columbine, and I heard those stories basically firsthand. Um, September 11th drew me in uh, to do something kind of bigger than myself. So I went into the SEAL teams for about 10 years. Um, I met my wife. Uh, I'm married with four kids. Uh, we got married in a courthouse in Virginia Beach that also had a mass shooting. So uh, I got out of the military to have a family. Um, and then I went to business school. I worked for Amazon for a while. And the Parkland shooting happened in uh, 2018. And we looked at it. We saw the footage of it. And we were pretty devastated by that. And we just see this stuff again and again. And we saw that there's footage of the shooter walking around with a gun before they ever fired a shot. We said, isn't somebody looking at this camera? And when we realized that nobody is, we said, we need to start a company that does that, that looks for guns. Because in a lot of these cases, particularly in the school shootings, the shooters are you know very bold and brazen and they don't, they don't really care if they're seen. And there's an opportunity to do something prior to shots being fired. So we've been doing this for about five years. It's guns out in the open. We're processing your videos in real time using AI saying, is there a gun in this image? Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Rob. Barb, over to you. Barb Davidson. I'm the director of Ingham County 911. Um, I've been in public safety for over 20 years and in the capacity of 911. I started as a dispatcher. Um, as far as our technology journey, I very vividly remember the days when the majority of our callers were calling from landlines. Um, I knew exactly where you were because you were physically wired to the structure that you were calling me from and how we in 911 had to become more nimble with the technology that was being offered to folks. And I think that is our technology journey right now is that we need to engage the public the way they want to be engaged by us instead of us dictating that. There are some expectations there that we need to rise to and be more nimble with. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you again for for joining us. And uh, I know you told me to call you Chris. I have a hard time with that, Chief Rosman, <laughs> but over to you, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Zach. Uh, my name is Chris Rosman. I'm the Chief of Police here at Michigan State University. I've been in uh, higher ed law enforcement for about 24 years now. Uh, my entire career at Michigan State University, which is a large campus, uh, one of the largest in the country in terms of land size, 51,000 students, 13,000 faculty staff, we're about nine square miles, 600 buildings. Um, operation at a, our police department is about 75 sworn is what we're authorized for. Uh, and we're very unique that we don't have our own PSAP or dispatch center. We utilize uh, Barb Dave, Barb's uh, group, which is phenomenal at Ingham County 911. So uh, happy to be here today and look forward to the conversation. Awesome. Again, thank you all for, for joining us. I wanted to just start and, and seed the conversation with a, some, some interesting facts uh, and then kind of ask uh, Chris and Barb to add some more color and, and ground us in the in the emotions maybe of it or what it felt like to, to go through some of this. But in 2022, uh, the U.S. saw nearly one school shooting every single day in our K through 12 schools. Uh, and 2022 was just a continuation of an increasing uh, trend of school incidents over the past 15 years. Uh, physical proximity to an incident also carries a high risk of mental health problems. Uh, one study of 44 school shootings found that antidepressant use increased more than 20% 
among young people who lived within five miles of a school shooting uh, versus those who lived within 15 miles away. Uh, unfortunately, K through 12 is not the only educational setting where we see these incidents. Um, just this past February 4, uh, 13th, Michigan State uh, University had four people killed and five injured uh, by a gunman. Um, as Chris alluded to, uh, the campus is uh, the sheer size of the campus plays uh, an outsized factor in, in these particular types of incidents. Um, Chris, you mentioned just the, the student body size is enormous. Uh, it's tied to Greater Lansing is amazing. Over 600 buildings, nine square miles. It's, it's a huge amount of area to cover. Um, as you think about uh, school and and uh, an incident happening within school. Um, interestingly, uh, correlated to these trends, we've also seen a huge adoption of camera systems in our schools and public buildings. Um, the National Center for Education Statistics states that almost 80% of elementary schools have security camera systems and 94% of high schools. Um, there's likely an equivalent uh, on, on higher education and college uh, uh, adoption as well. With that kind of grounding, and, and Rob really set uh, the stage and, and tied us back and made us remember a number of these, these major incidents um, throughout our, our history over the past 20 years. Um, Chris, uh, talk me through a little bit of what it was like, you know, February uh, 13th for you um, uh, and, and what MSU went through during that, during that time. Yeah, you know, obviously the violence that we experienced in February was was so significant and it's uh, almost beyond comprehension what we dealt with. But to, to the credit of our uh, partners um, in this area, our training um, was on was on par with what we needed to, to handle that situation. The law enforcement community in this area that we have a great collaborative relationship with responded uh, very quickly to assist us. We relied on our training and the response efforts was something that I can't commend our people enough for. Um, you know, the, the one challenge for us is we have a centralized access control system on campus that we started years ago. So all of our buildings were able to control perimeter access control. And while we have thousands of cameras on campus, um, they are individually kind of owned by different departments and units. Uh, and we're at the time. And while we had access to those systems, uh, they weren't monitored live time um, at the time. And so we had already identified that as a gap uh, in our um, safety portfolio that we were working to, uh, to close at the time of this incident. So luckily we already had an RFP out for a new centralized security system to bring together access control and camera systems campus wide. But in February, um, you know, those systems were not uh, centrally monitored and that's something that we're working towards. Um, but, you know, again, the, 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 the after effects of an incident like that, um, the, the post-traumatic healing and the post-traumatic growth is something that we're still dealing with today. And there are so many lessons that we learned that we hope to, to share with others so that they can uh, improve and, and better prepare as well. And, and Barb, from your perspective, again, uh, Chris mentioned that they don't have their own uh, ECC or, or PSAP and, and you guys act they as do. That. They have us. <laughs> they have you guys. Um, uh, you know, if, if Chris was blind, if Chief Roseman was, was blind, and again, I'll just, the camera system is not connected. How did, were you guys feeling that same thing? And what has that prompted you guys to, to do, uh, from your perspective moving forward? I think there's a skill set on our side of it, our side of the radio, where we anticipate always being blind for lack of a better way to explain it. Um, the skill set that the dispatchers have to be able to de-escalate a caller and get information out of them to be able to relay it in a thoughtful way that is prudent and time sensitive to the responders is something that the dispatchers do every day. Um, to the chief's point, I don't think there's much more I could say about our public safety partners um, and how the relationships that we have built with each other and how complementary they are, um, being able to appreciate the seat you sit in and how we run up next to each other. Yes, Michigan State University doesn't have their own 911 center, but they are our public safety partner. Um, they're an excellent resource for so many things I think that part of it, I don't think I can say enough about it. 
unfortunately, the incident in February, um, the training that we had all done together um, in case of we had to use. Um, and yeah, I think our staffs are all still feeling some of the repercussions, um, things that we're still dealing with as community members, um, yeah. parents, um, the 911 director, the chief of police, the, yeah. But I think there's one thing I couldn't be more complimentary of. It's my public safety partners and how we interacted together every day, but specifically that evening. Yep. I'd love to maybe again, stay with you guys and then we'll turn it over to, to Rob who works with camera systems in these kind of settings uh, a lot. But um, I want to talk a little bit more about the camera systems. Uh, Chief, you mentioned unifying and making sure that you get access to them. Um, what is it that you want to see from that? Again, just, you know, it, let's say that the system's kind of working and it's connected. What's helpful? What's what's not? How do you take action? How do you guys want to in, ingest and use video uh, from your perspective? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I would start by pointing out it's the entire safety and security portfolio. So it's not just video. So when we were looking at going down the path of centralizing our security systems, to us, that meant access control, video, weapons detection, um, you know, overlaying CAD call data. So looking at things from really a holistic perspective to bring everything together, and then most importantly, build out a security operations center separate from our PSAP that is the link in between where those systems can be monitored live time by full-time employees to then utilize any technology that, that we implement. And you know, we had that in, in motion uh, before February. Um, we had external consultants that came in. We knew the path that we wanted to go down, which was centralizing all of our security systems on campus bringing all of our disparate video systems together into one centralized system. So all of those cameras, and there were thousands, um, could be centralized on one video management system with one platform. And so we had identified that we were working towards that, and we're even closer to that now. And we are currently in the progress of uh, process of building out that security operations center. We've hired full-time staff, we've hired supervisors, we're renovating space, and we're actively switching to that, that new system. Um, and we're excited at the opportunities that uh, that system presents uh, in the future to then introduce uh, analytics and different things um, as part of that as well. So we're definitely moving in the right direction. Uh, it was something, like I said, that we had already identified uh, as a gap beforehand. Um, and we hope that as we build out that technology, that security operations center, that there's a direct link to our PSAP, our 911 center, and that we can share information uh, live time uh, to better assist not only our dispatchers, but our first responders in the field from our agency and all agencies that partner with us uh, every day. Awesome. Barb, anything to, to add on how you guys would want to ingest or use video or multimedia? Um, yeah. I mean, I think kind of to the chief's point, it's sort of that, and I'm sure Rob is going to talk about this. It's, it's that AI stuff, the before the hello, if you know, we talk about that a lot, the hello to hello, when I pick up the call to when the chief is face to face with whatever the situation may be, and being able to utilize that data and having that real time crime center, really, um, to be able to leverage that data and having AI play into that. Um, so we can have some of those things, you know, that data is awesome, but data that's verified by a person um, cause there's data everywhere, but we have to be able to leverage it in a, in a way that makes it prudent to what the situation is. So, um, for us that having that human verification is, it's awesome. AI is obviously a direction we're all going in. Um, but yeah, to be able to leverage that data in a, a prudent way for the responders, and Rob, I don't know, Rob. I feel like I just softballed it to you. I was going to say that's well, a great um, tee up. That's a great tee up, um, <laughs> Rob. I'm going to intersect kind of Barb's tee up on human verified application of AI. We've got a great question from uh, the audience as well that I wanted to interweave into into this, which is, you know, there are so many places with established camera systems. How how do we layer in 
AI or ingest AI, you know, video from that and apply AI within those systems. Um, I, I, I'd love your perspective on kind of that intersection. Yeah. So, uh, you know, these events are heartbreaking and having, you know, talking to the people who had to deal with it. I just want to give better tools in the future to make that less likely to happen. You know, I, I don't view ourselves. We're not the, the one solution or anything like that. We're a part of this whole ecosystem and that not entire idea of what do you do with all of this data that you have? I'm looking at the data of the cameras and it turns out like that's fixed. So I know where all the cameras are. I know how they're networked. I know how to access them. So, you know, what we do, you know, we go and get the feeds and try to figure out where, where all that information is because those are all known entities. What you don't know is what happens on those cameras, you know, on a moment to moment basis, but you certainly know where they are. And if you're going to set up a better situation, so first responders can be at the right place at the right time with the right equipment, everybody's going to do much better. And if you give just a little bit of help to that, so how cameras are networked in university systems or whatever it is, like we've seen a lot of these situations where they're fractured and the, the best outcome is going to kind of unite them in one place where everybody has access to it and we can talk, you know, about what we see. So the only thing that we do is we look for guns, our AI scans all of those cameras. And then that person to person connection is what you're going to do. We verify. So we're going to get false positives because, you know, our AI is looking, is there a gun in this image? Is there a gun? Is there a gun? And all of these data feeds are known, like it's known entities. You can go to the real time streaming protocol feeds, whether it's in a VMS, whether it's not uh, the video management systems, like how, how and where all of these feeds, we go do the homework beforehand. You know, ideally before anything bad ever happens, we go figure out where all these feeds are going. We make sure that they go to the same point. We make sure that we talk to the same point of contacts. We go through drills so that that hello to hello that we have, they're ready to receive it. They know who we are. They know what we're going to pass. So it can be really, really succinct. We can do that with data through the rapid SOS portal, but we're always going to back that up with a call. So that person, do you receive what we saw? Are you getting this? Do you see what we're looking at? Where is this? Well, I know what I just saw and I know where this camera is and we're talking about it. And then you can get the first responders for that information, ideally in a very short time span so that they can be at the right place at the right time with the right equipment. You're just going to do a little bit better at everything that you can do in life if you could do those things. So a lot of it is we, we do the, the homework beforehand. When we do these installs, we aggregate those feeds. We do homework. We do drills. We make sure that Everybody knows who's going to talk, so it's not unexpected. Because a PSAP's job is just, I only deal with unexpected all the time, and you have to help people. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting, in, in some of the earlier sessions that I either participated in or attended, there was a, a focus on human-centered design and, and sort of making sure that when we apply AI um, you know, to these things, that we're doing it in a way that is digestible and usable by the people who who need to take action on it. Um, I, I guess, Barb and Chris, where do you guys, what do you guys think is the most important thing? Again, from maybe the responder perspective, Chief, like, is it is it arriving on your phone? Like, what is what is actionable and human-centered look like from your perspective? And and Barb, I think from the, from the 911 perspective, you'd have a different kind of view of what is actionable from you. So I'd love to get your perspective on, on that, like, when the information, the actionable information arrives, what does it look like? What does it feel like? Yeah, and I'll start by saying that it's important to make sure that the foundational basics are in place in terms of just radio interoperability, data, CAD interoperability, and so forth. And what I see at some other institutions of higher ed is they're kind of on an island by themselves. So I would really highlight that um, that <laughs> need for even the, the before we get to the AI level, the, the basics to be in place, just so everyone can talk to each other, everyone can operate on the same platform, which is something that we had that we were very fortunate for. Um, the other thing that's useful for our responders uh, is, to, is to understand that, especially with our students these days, whether it's um, secondary education, higher education, that they want to get information to us in a lot of different ways. And that includes texting 911 and the ability to share pictures and videos live time. And that's something that we had done uh, here in the area as well. And the ability to share that information live time with responders in the field where it may benefit them uh, from a response perspective. And so I commend Barb and her team for being forward thinking and really looking at that 
um, live sharing of of data and video and multimedia because that's really uh, what we're seeing with our with our young adults these days is they they just expect that they're going to be able to to share that and someone's going to be able to receive it. Yeah, sure. I, Barb, you want to elaborate on that too? I mean, we highlighted that in our pre conversations, just the power of being able to communicate with folks the way that they want to be communicated with. Yes. I mean, I don't know how else to say it other than to say yes. I mean, data is, it's so important, but it, I can't be inundated with it. And I can't be searching around trying to get to it. So one of the things that we had as a takeaway from February was that we needed to put a system in place um, where we could engage people the way they wanted to be engaged. If you wanted to send me a pre-recorded video, I I didn't we needed to do it in a way that you could do it quickly. This was actionable intelligence that folks had. We needed to do that as prudently as possible. So that is what we did, but again it comes with being able to talk to our partners and there's a lot of tech out there and it's really cool. Um, it has to be purposeful. Um, it has to be purposeful to the things that we need to do. So I can't be inundated. I need to be able to leverage it in a thoughtful way to be able to get the responders where they need to be with the intelligence they need to have to be able to protect the public. That's that's what we do. So I need to be able to do that as quickly and nimbly as possible. So that's the goal. And we needed to stay with the goal. Rapid SOS and that platform and having a platform where a lot of these technologies work together. That's another thing. I mean, I only have so many folks. I can't have a monitor here and a monitor here and a monitor here and a monitor here. So 70 yeah. different apps. And yeah, gotta, yeah you know, no, we're, we're we can't a big do believer that. in trying to unify that and simplify that. Bring it in. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's so important. I mean, there's so many of us that are. You know, I don't have just some extra staff. Yep. I don't know anybody who does. And if you do, I want to know how you did it. <laughs> yeah. And there's so much technology out there, like Barb said, that we have to make sure we're picking the right technology for the right purpose. And, you know, we find a lot of value. We're able now to, to live stream body camera video from our officers in the field. And we find that extremely beneficial. Um, but that's just one example that it, it's it's one of those things that you hear about. It sounds cool, but is it actually actionable? And does it benefit us? And is it is it worth it? So um, we're constantly looking and evaluating all the technology that's out there. Rob, I wanted to I wanted to put you on the spot and again incorporate a, a question that's coming in from the audience a little bit here. And um, computer vision has been around; it's been really advanced. We've gotten you know at least from the training we we've we've got much better. I mean, I've seen you guys like object detection, and especially since you guys are human verifying, object detection, gun detection is is. I think pretty amazing. Um, the audience wants to kind of know, can we apply the same kind of thing to other school incidents? And, and I think they they called out like bullying um, as one thing. And so I wanted to get the technical perspective from you and then chief, and, and I, I'd love to get your perspective because we've kind of chatted about the always on camera systems and how does the community feel about that? And I don't think any of us love the idea of bullying, but again, catching bullying is is possibly something which is a little bit more sensitive. So Rob, a little bit maybe to the technology portion of how do we capture, can we capture some of these more abstract concepts um, with AI? Do you see a, a, a future for that? I absolutely see a future. I, I know other companies who are doing it. We are personally not doing that at all. However, there are, you have to you have to take good data in. And for us, good data is pretty simple. We do it ourselves. We walk around on similar types of cameras with guns. We use every type of gun. If we are afraid there's a new type of gun that's being used, like the 3D printed or something like that, add it to our model, always get better every single day. And our our thing has to be, you know, very, very high precision. So we're, you know, we don't want to be the jack of all trades. We want to be the master of one. Because the, if, if you don't, you know, do the thing that you're trying to do, the, it, it could be devastating. Not preventing a fight is probably, you know, less detrimental. So if you had a false positive, you know, X amount of percentage, 
uh, that's probably more within reason, whether you miss one or you say things are more of a fight more often than they're not or bullying, at least it gives that, that idea to, uh, to look at what it is. That's where AI is like really good use case. So you could use audio, like what there, there might be keywords that are used in bullying. And that's, that's one thing. And if, if there may be motions on a camera where you could tell whether a fight is doing, like when someone's laying on the ground, I know that that's something that's highly predictive of. That's that's not common behavior. You shouldn't ever see anybody laying on the ground. So if you have a data set of that and you, you know, commingle it with that sound and you put all of those things together, you take all of these data points and you make definitions. And you say this combined with this equals perhaps bullying or fight or whatever it may be. There's a lot of really clever things. There's companies doing this, and I, I think it's very impressive. And all of those things are, uh, I think, they're doable and they're definable. The more clever you are, and the more that you you uh, you have more variables, like three variables combined, you're, you're going to have a very high likelihood of like reaching the result you want. You're not going to be perfect though in those things. So it's not going to be used in every single case. Do I see a future where like that gets better and better? The more sensors that you have, the better that you're going to be. The more uh, variables that you can, you don't even need, let's say you're 80% correct five times, like you're going to be pretty correct. Um, so all of those things are very promising. I, I'm acutely aware of that. You know, we don't, you know, we have a lot of R and D on different things. We're not technically doing that, but there, there's certainly possibilities if you're, if you're just clever and more innovative and in how you take data and make it into something usable, because a lot of the data is collected and not used. And particularly when there's a massive amount, that's the opportunity to use to apply AI to something. Two key points I want to highlight from that, uh, that I took away, Rob, uh, first, I, I love the idea of specialization and getting really good at something. Uh, and trying not to be the jack of all trades because you'll probably not be great at everything. And so I, I appreciate that you guys are getting real good at gun detection. Uh, second, real quick, Chief, is it common to have people laying on the ground, maybe post big football games? It feels like something you might actually have a lot of, maybe not from fights, but... Uh, yeah, it's actually a good example. And that's one that is relevant because we host large special events. Uh, for us, a football game can draw from, you know, 80 to 100,000 people. And we're actively working those crowds with, uh, you know, explosive, body-worn explosive detection dogs. We have weapons detection systems in place at the gates. But the ability to overlay analytics onto our cameras monitoring the crowd to identify someone who may have fallen, maybe experiencing a medical emergency or a bag that's been left unattended, for a long amount of time that we could, uh, you know, dispatch resources to investigate, you know, that that item that may be suspicious. Those are definitely things that we're interested in using uh, using this technology for. Awesome. Uh, we're coming up towards the end, and I've been trying to end each of these sessions with um, something that I believe strongly in, which is, um, especially as technologists, uh, we've got to be dog fooding and using the technology that we're trying to push into our communities into our to our partners. And so I'd love to turn it over and kind of go around the room. Uh, personally, how are you guys using AI in your own, in your own lives? Um, any, any interesting learnings uh, uh, or, or t uh, stories to tell? Um, Barb, uh, maybe over to you and then we'll go uh, chief and we'll end with Rob. I don't know. I like Alexa. Um, I'm kidding. Um, in my own personal life, Probably not a ton more than kind of the Siri Alexa thing, but um, I was asked about and find very interesting some of the ways that people are thinking outside of the box to be able to leverage AI in particular in like a quality assurance kind of a arena. If a bot can answer some yes, no questions after getting... Um, the audio from a 911 call, did this happen? Did this happen? Did this happen? Um, to take the amount of quality assurance that is the national standard for a center like ours that's taking 400,000 calls a year. And it's like, well, it's only 2%. That's a ton. That, yeah. That's a ton. Um, and to then be able to take some of that work off so that we can focus our supervision to be able to do that coaching and training and and how we should maybe be leveraging AI in those kind of arenas as well. I think it's very interesting, something that we're looking at. Uh, all of you watching, take note. Barb's, 
Barb's in the market for some, some QA automation. No, don't do it. <laughs> Chief, how about you in your personal life? Any, anything that you've been experimenting with? Yeah, not so much on the AI on on the AI side. Uh, definitely into kind of advanced technology and some different things, but not so much on the on the AI. Um, the one thing from a, you know kind of a chief executive perspective is really just more situational awareness of kind of everyday things and the ability to, you know, now we have a, you know an iOS CAD app where as an executive I can kind of actively monitor kind of live calls and then. You know, if a call is put in for an active shooting, uh, you know, to have a system in place that based on call type automatically notifies, you know, a command staff off duty so we don't have to start making phone calls and things. So those are the kind of things that, that we look at in terms of advanced technology, or at least me personally, but not so much on the on the AI side, but excited about the future. Yeah. All right. Rob, I'll send it with you. So you've asked this question before. So one thing I do is uh, all my meetings and all everything is recorded and then outcomes of like how we're doing our meetings, uh, how we do staffing is AI and a different one that I'm going to add. So I do a lot of like health monitoring. So like I wear, you know, a whoop and that can tell you how you're doing. But there, to take a step further, one of my friends is doing a company about mental health and you take a lot of this data and you can predict mental health. So like I came out of the military, I was around a lot of traumatic things. Um, and like a lot of my friends suffer, uh, just coming through it. And like, we try to check up on each other. And so you take some of that data. And when you know that someone is, uh, not doing well with a lot of that, like those signs, they're like, you probably should call your friend up. And so that is a way to use AI that's like tangible. And it's the, we, we still don't know the answer with mental health stuff. So there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Nice. I, I, I love that one. I'm going to look that one up. Uh, here we are at the end of the session. 30 minutes goes by so fast. Um, I hope this was enjoyable for everybody. I hope it was uh, uh, educational uh, for some. And uh, Rob, Barb, uh, Chief, thank you so much for the time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you, preparing for this, uh, and getting to know you each a little bit more. So thank you again. And uh, for everybody here on the East Coast, have a wonderful evening. If you're on the West Coast, have a great afternoon. Um, all right. We'll talk to you all soon. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you.